אחר הצהריים טובים, ברוכים הבאים, Welcome to the keynote session, but before the introduction of our main speaker, I'm very, very happy to welcome His Excellency, the German ambassador to Israel, Dr. Clemens von Goetze. The ambassador is a good friend of the Institute, and uh, we met in several occasions, and we are honored, Mr. Ambassador, to have you here, and I would, would like to invite you to say a few words of greetings to this conference. Bevakasha. Yeah, Professor Feiner, Professor Schorsch, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for, for having me. You, you are right, we have a very good and um, very close relation between the embassy and, and the institute, but that's no wonder since the institute is dealing with the history of Judaism in Germany, and that was a very, very close relation until the Nazis came. And it's, um, it, it's for us, a great joy to see that um, also this conference is devoted to quite a huge part to this um, very important part of Jewish history and of German history. I just dis discussed it with Professor Schorsch. Um, Jewish scientists and the science of Judaism were a very important part of our academic uh, life until the Nazis came. and. Um, to discuss that, to see the roots, and to see that now, nowadays, after the abyss of the Shoah, this can again be thoroughly discussed between uh, Israeli, Jewish, and uh, German scholars is, is a great joy to see. Um, when preparing for this conference, um, and I had not yet the digitalized library from Frankfurt, um, uh, and found in my own library, I have to admit, only the wonderful book of Amos Elon, but uh, that was not deep enough to enter into the subjects you are uh, discussing here. The thing I found was a conversations uh, lexicon, an encyclopedia of Maya of the year 1906, which I have from my grand-grandfather in my, in my shelves at home. And I just looked up the, the word Judentum and Jewish literature. And I found it very interesting what I found there. I mean, it was not only a long description on uh, all those uh, scholars that uh, you will be discussing in the, in the days to come, meaning uh, from Moses Mendelssohn and David Friedländer over Leopold Zunz, who's 200 years um, uh, works we are, we are uh, discussing, or you are discussing, Abraham Geiger, uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch, and others, all they were, were cited there. But more interestingly, um, there was also a long list of um, those institutions that in the year 1906 and in the uh, decades before dealt with uh, the Wissenschaft des Judentums, the science of, of Judaism in Germany. And there was not only mentioned uh, the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, founded in Berlin in 1872, um, but also the rabbinical seminars in Breslau, Münster, Kassel, Hannover, Würzburg, Köln, um, the schools in Sesen, Dessau, uh, Frankfurt, Berlin, Samson Schule Wolfenbüttel, and, and so on. And different uh, societies uh, exactly for that purpose. So there was the Gesellschaft zur Förderung der Wissenschaft des Judentums, that was the umbrella organization founded then in 1902, but before there were many others, many um, uh, journals, uh, I, I will not cite them all, but it's a list of more than uh, half a dozen uh, journals that were published over, um, over many years. Um, and. Um, there's also an interesting figure that in the year 1904, um, there were 180 associations dealing with Jewish history and literature all over Germany. And those scholars that this encyclopedia alone cites that were dealing with uh, Jewish uh, science, there's more than 100 names are made in an encyclopedia in, in one article. So I think all that, at least for me, showed the depth uh, 
and the width of um, der Wissenschaft des Judentums in Germany um, until uh, uh, the year 1933 when the Nazi destroyed what has, had been growing in Germany um, and flourished so, so wonderfully. And then in 1945, um, Rabbi Leo Beck uh, uh, said, um, after having been liberated from the, and I stress that here, Nazi German concentration camp in Auschwitz, he said, our belief was that German and Jewish spirit could meet on German soil and become a blessing through their marriage. This was an illusion. The era of the Jews in Germany is over once and for all. For me as a German ambassador to Israel, it's very good to see that at least this has not happened completely and we have a very flourishing scientific and social life of Jews in Germany and that's what we are very grateful for. I wish you very good discussions and an interesting conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. I think the next uh, conference you'll be able to give an academic lecture uh, on this topic, and I really appreciate it and appreciate your presence here, which is really very meaningful uh, to us because um, actually, as we discussed uh, earlier, we are now celebrating uh, an, an event, a revo revolution in Jewish history that happened 200 years ago in Germany, in Berlin, but still very, very much relevant. And in the middle of dispute, when we are looking uh, at the, the future, and there will be a session uh, later about uh, Jewish studies, uh, the future of Jewish studies, and what's going on in Israel, which is really, really important uh, to us uh, today. So uh, thank you for these greetings. And now uh, to our main speaker. We couldn't find a better scholar to deliver the keynote lecture of this conference than Professor Ismar Shosh, one of the top experts in the history of Jewish studies. And on behalf of the LBI Institute and the organizing committee, I would like to thank him warmly for accepting our invitation and making the efforts which we very much appreciate. I'm sure that most of you here are familiar with Professor Shosh, many publications and distinguished academic positions, but I find it important to introduce him uh, at the opening of uh, our conference even briefly. Professor Shosh is a graduate of the Rabbinical School of the Jewish Theological Seminary and received his MA and doctorate in history from Columbia University. From 1968 to 1970, he taught full-time at Columbia and returned to the seminary in 1970 as an assistant professor of Jewish history. And from, from 1975 to 1979, he served as the founding dean of the graduate school. And from 1980 to 84, as he provost. And in 80, 1986, the seminary board elected him as the sixth chancellor a post in which he served for 20 years. Today he holds the title Chancellor Emeritus and Herman Abramovich Distinguished Service Professor. Among his various publications, Jewish Reaction to German Antisemitism, 1870-1914, a volume on Heinrich Gretz, and From Text to Context, which was also published in Hebrew in 2000 by the Zalman Shazar Center, the title Apnia Lavar Bayadut a Moderni, maybe the, the, actually the most important book uh, on the topic. He also published a Torah commentary, Canon Without Closure, in 2007, and a series of six essays on Leopold Soons, Moritz Stein, Schneider, uh, Ignaz Goldsheer, and Salomon Schechter, as well as a study of the contribution of Wissenschaft scholars to the study of Islam in the 19th century. His last book was published a year ago and is, of course, very relevant to this conference, a biography of Leopold Soons, titled Leopold Soons, Creativity in Adversity, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. So, Professor Shosh, it is a pleasure to welcome you here, and we are looking forward to listening to your lecture titled 
in the shadow of Wellhausen, Heinrich Goetz as a biblical critic. Bevakasha. Mr. Ambassador, I'm honored by your presence. And I regard your presence uh, as, more, as not mere, merely symbolic. The presence of the German ambassador to Israel is a statement of the importance of Germany today in the study of Judaism and Jewish history. There are more than 1,000 books that are published annually in Germany on Judaism and the Jewish experience. Not all of them are of scholarly import, but all of them are concerned with the Jewish experience in Germany. And I, as I have said to my students and colleagues, you cannot be a scholar of Judaism today without knowing German. And that is not because of what was published before 1939, but because of what is appearing today in Germany. After Israel and the United States, Germany has become the third most productive center of Jewish scholarship in the world. So your presence, Mr. Ambassador, underscores just how important this conference is to Germany. Professor Feiner, I thank you for the honor of delivering this uh, uh, lecture. And since I uh, make the assumption that all of you have bought and read my book, I decided not to speak on Leopold Sutz. So you will have to endure a lecture this evening on an early love of mine, that is Heinrich Gretz. But if you wish to see my maturation as a scholar, you simply have to note my progression from Gretz to Zunz. But I return to Gretz because a part of Gretz has been overlooked. It is well known that Heinrich Gretz completed his monumental 11-volume Geschichte der Juden with the publication of volumes one and two in three consecutive years from, 19, from 1874 to 1876. Though the last two appear, these three volumes covered the ancient history of Israel from its uh, elusive origins to the Maccabean period. Prior to composing them, Gretz visited Palestine in the company of two friends in March 1872 to fulfill a long cherished dream. Two years later, he would write in the foreword to volume one that to truly understand the text of the Bible, he had first to tour the land with the Bible in hand in order to view its largely unchanged landscape through its own words. With these densely packed volumes, Gretz thrust himself into the field of biblical scholarship, which had been the domain of Protestant savants since the Reformation. Less appreciated is the unexpected fact that until his death, in 1891, it would remain his primary field of research. Indeed, if we begin our count from 1871, when Gretz published two separate book-length monographs on Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs, we may assert that he devoted the last 20 years of his life to the study of the Hebrew Bible. As he confided in a letter to his close friend Raphael Kirchheim in January 1872, I have pretty much left 
off doing history, undertaking no research, no new research. Now I am mainly focusing on biblical exegesis. The sheer quantity of Gretz's scholarship on the Hebrew Bible during those two decades was massive, with much of it published in the Monatsschrift für die Geschichte und Wissenschaft des Studentums, the flagship journal of the Breslau Theological Seminary. Gretz had become its editor in 1869, and he would remain at its helm for the next 19 years. In consequence, its pages brimmed with essays, both wide-ranging in scope and meticulous in details, that pursued biblical scholarship on many fronts. Thus, while the Monatsschrift gave Gretz a handy vehicle for developing and disseminating his views. It was his teaching of Bible at the seminary from 1854 and at the University of Breslau as an honorary professor from 1870 that nourished his interest and expertise on the subject. In addition to teaching annually a heavy course load of Talmud, Jewish history and Hebrew grammar at the seminary. Gretz regularly also taught courses on biblical books from all three divisions of the Hebrew Bible, hence his emergence in the 1870s as a biblical critic was a culmination long in formation. Gretz's biblical scholarship was neither narrow nor repetitive. Produced at a torrid pace, its ample quantity transmuted into a corpus of expansive scope. He firmly believed, for instance, that lower criticism was the indispensable first step of higher criticism, and a good portion of his grammatical studies and line-by-line -line commentaries on Psalms and Proverbs were intended to help him recover a text that made sense. Toward that end, he made extensive use of ancient Aramaic, Syriac, and Greek translations in the belief that they preserved an alternate or even better version of the original Hebrew text in question. In reviewing Benjamin Zold's Hebrew commentary of Job in the Monatschrift, he chided its author for his uncompromising deference to the Masoretic text. Job's Hebrew was too corrupt to be illuminated solely by grammatical tools, the principles of biblical parallelism, par parallelism and poetic figures of speech, or as he told Zola respectively in a letter, all exe exegetical tools are useless if we don't admit that the text is in a faulty state. The primary goal is to get the text right. Put differently, Gretz's practice of close reading constituted a determined campaign to enhance a sense of appreciation for the plain meaning of the Hebrew Bible. To be sure, many of its textual conundrums derive from the slip of a copyist. Gretz devoted an entire essay to identifying multiple instances of dittography in which their absence in ancient translations suggested an inattentive copyist as the source of the error. On a deeper level, however, it was the ingrained venerable predilection of the non-literal reading by Jews and Christians alike that distorted the authorial intent of the original. The figurative, allegorical mode of interpretation of the New Testament and the Church Fathers 
no less than that of the rabbis of the Midrash and Kabbalah, filled words with ever more far-reaching new meanings without tampering with the orthography. The words of scripture should not be made to bear an infinity of meanings, and it was incumbent upon Jews to rid their sacred books of figments of imagination devoid of verifiable substance for both internal and external consumption. The misreading of scripture Gretz declaimed readily gave rise to or reinforced prejudice. The upshot of Gretz's preoccupation with lower criticism was a profusion of emendations dispersed throughout his research, clearly collected by him and brought out immediately after his death by his former student Wilhelm Bacher a pillar of rabbinic scholarship at the Budapest Rabbinical Seminary since its founding in 1877. Published in three installments totaling 138 pages, the emendations offered textual corrections to nearly every book of the Bible from Genesis through Proverbs. Though Christian exegetes had long sought to improve the plausibility of the text by recourse to emendations, no Jewish Wissenschaft scholar in Germany of his era came close to matching his abandonment to amend. Gretz generally disdained the emendations of Christian scholars, especially those of Heinrich Ewald, the brilliant but erratic and irascible dean of Semitic languages in Göttingen in the generation prior to Julius Wellhausen and Wellhausen's teacher. As early as 1861, Gretz summoned Jewish scholarship, Jewish scholars with their superior knowledge of Hebrew, the Bible, and the language of the Mishnah to place the exegesis of the Bible on a truly scientific footing. Underlying Gretz's unfettered penchant for emendations was his principled rejection of the Tanakh's Masoretic text as a precise and reliable witness. The issue had long been a bone of contention, pitting Christian and Jewish students of the Hebrew Bible. To reaffirm the sanctity of the Masoretic text of the Pentateuch in the face of Christian devaluation was at least part of the motivation that inspired Moses Mendelssohn's pioneering German translation of the Torah in Hebrew characters between 1781 and 83. But by the time Gretz threw himself into biblical scholarship, he no longer held that conviction. His own energetic study of the emergence of the Masoretic editors of the Bible's received Hebrew text led him to conclude that they were actually Karaites and not Rabbinites that their labors were hobbled by countless internal squabbles, and that above all, their effort to finalize and annotate the official language in all its endless details came along much too late in the millennial transmission of the original text. By the time the Masoretes, the Masoretes came, got to work in the 19th and 10th centuries in Palestine and Babylonia, the text of the Tanakh had been repeatedly damaged by the vicissitudes of Jewish history. Moreover, the belatedness of systems of vocalization and diacritical punctuation, coupled with a less rigorous mode of transmitting the prophets and the writings, 
resulted in a confusing panoply of variant readings. In short, the Masora was not authoritative. Increasingly, this was, interestingly, this was not Gretz's opinion in 1860, when he published volume five of his Geschichte that dealt with the Gaonic period. Therein, he did no more than mention that the Masoretic enterprise originated with the Karaites. But by the mid-decades of the century, but the mid-decades of the century witnessed a spurt of manuscript publications that revealed more clearly the identity, nature, and scope of the Masoretic project. Gretz's essays followed these developments carefully, and by 1882, when he published the first volume of his commentary to Psalms, he laid out his case at length on the fluidity of the biblical text. As a parting shot in 1909, in the fourth revised edition of volume five, Gretz vigorously re reiterated his argument for the need to amend. Unfortunate times and sheer unscrupulousness had already inflicted extensive de devastation on the text, and the Masura could only attest the state of the text as it appeared at the time. The Masoretes could only prevent future distortions, but not repair the damage of centuries. Nor did they have any inkling of the ruin affected internally. Despite the allegedly deplorable state of the Masoretic text, Gretz, to his credit, did formulate rules that helped him identify textual corruptions. In his well-ordered introduction to Psalms, he spelled out some eight types of errors to which copyists were prone. Adding to their number was the fact that, uh, according to Gretz, the copyists of Psalms tended to be teachers of young children, unsupervised by rabbinic authority. Without doubt, however, Gretz succeeded in practice the freedom claimed in theory. His study of Job alone generated nearly 300 emendations. Innumerable emendations were simply conjectures unwarranted by any ancient witness or the appearance of the word elsewhere in the Bible or the parallelism in which the word was set. Gretz bristled at words that defied his comprehension and was often impelled to render them plausible by an emendation, even if that meant replacing a common word with one that was rare. And many an emendation derived arbitrarily from instances where the received text offended Gretz's refined sense of biblical Hebrew. The Breslau lore that when Gretz recited a Haftorah in the synagogue, Frankel would repeat it without emendation, gets, uh, gains a measure of credence from the abandon with which Gretz emended the Masoretic text. Gretz plunged into the minefield of higher criticism with purposeful vigor. In the course of preparing, composing, and following up his history of ancient Israel down to the Maccabees, he touched on every book of the Hebrew Bible, often at great length. To convey a sense of his conclusions and the self-confidence with which he propounded them, I think it preferable to treat the three divisions of the Hebrew Bible in reverse order of their arrangement in the canon. Only then will we be able to detect the motivation 
that drove his dedication and to assess its results. Gretz negotiated the enormous chronological shift from the final volume of his history ending in 1848 to volume one beginning in 1500 BCE by focusing first on some of the late books of the Hebrew Bible. Thus in 1871 he came out with extensive studies of Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Daniel, and a preliminary one on Esther. In accordance with his ethos as a historian, Gretz's overriding objective in all his biblical scholarship was to date the text he was studying. The meaning of a text derived ineluctably from the context in which it was composed. Thus, the evidence in Ecclesiastes of Greek, Latin, and especially Aramaic words convinced Gretz to date the book to the period of Herod. He dismissed the Solomonic attribution of the book's opening line contending rather that the king profiled therein was Herod, whom the author cast as a sober philosopher of life, equally contemptuous of religious fanaticism and unadulterated hedonism. The author's ethical intent was to staunch the decadent lifestyle of an age mired in an excess of wealth materialism and infidelity. To accommodate his late dating of Ecclesiastes, Gretz pronounced a three-stage process of canonization that would long shape the discourse on the subject. Canonization required an authoritative body. Gretz identified three. Ezra, Nehemiah, and the men of the great assembly who collectively canonized the prophets, that of the sages dominated by the militantly anti-Roman followers of Shammai prior to the first rebellion against Rome in 66 BCE, who admitted most of the writings into the canon and finally, that of the rabbinic assembly that met at Yavna some 20, theor, 20 years after the destruction of the Second Temple, which sealed the canon with the acceptance of Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs. Song of Songs squeezed in under the wire, not because it was read as a theological allegory, but rather as a didactic poem celebrating the purity of love without sex. Gretz found equally offensive Ernst Renan's early dating as a secular evocation of physical love in a natural setting, or the later rabbinic interpretation of a love that united God and Israel in an eternal bond of fidelity. A serious student of Christian Bible critics, Gretz adopted Ewald's moral reading of the tract and Anton Theodor Hartmann's detection of Arabic usage in its language to suggest a post-exilic date. Specifically, Gretz dated the composition to the years 230 to 218 BCE, when the Tobiad clan rose to power as tax collectors for the Egyptian court in Palestine and Alexandria. He averred, in addition, that the book was the poetic achievement of a single gifted writer who knew the language, literature, and customs of the Hellenistic world. The Hebrew term apirion was definitely of Greek origin, despite Ewald's contortions to come up with an Arabic cognate. 
Gret scoffed at the practice to search for possible Arabic cognates to explain difficult Hebrew words. The poet chose Solomon's opulent court and urban ostentation as the setting for his cautionary tales because they resembled a culture morally unmoored. The lovers he heralded embodied the wholesome simplicity of young folks nurtured in the pristine surroundings of nature. What seemed to take Gretz often far afield from the plain meaning of a text was the basic assumption with which he approached the entire corpus of the writings. To his mind, they were all tendentious in character. That is engendered and forged by a message or point of view other than the surface language used to express it. The task of the historian qua exegete was to strip away the layers of camouflage that concealed the author's actual intent. Once this philological toolkit suggested a plausible context, however, his fertile imagination weighed in with a trove of supporting details, often more speculative than the evidentiary. A prime example of this strength as weakness was the Book of Esther, which Gretz posited to be a fiction composed during the Maccabean uprising alongside the Book of Daniel. Both were intended to bolster the faint-hearted, while Daniel, with its affirmation of a belief in life after death, and its messianic motifs was aimed at a religious readership, Esther, bereft of even a single reference to God, was aimed at a secular one. Proof positive that Esther was written by a resident of Palestine was its language. Diaspora Jews did not wield sufficient command of Hebrew to express themselves fluently in their ancestral language. But the text brimmed with allusions to its Hellenistic dating. Prior to Alexander, to Alexander, one could not speak of Jews as scattered and dispersed, or whose laws are different from those of another people. The traits of Ahasuerus were meant to limb the figure of Antiochus, especially his preoccupation with the revenue of his realm. Haman promised to reimburse the royal treasury with 10,000 talents of silver for permission to rid the realm of all Jews, and his unexpected fall sought to reassure secular Jews that God's, beneficent, that God's benevolence operated even when undetected. Perhaps most far-fetched was the terminology and ritual of Purim on the basis of a widespread Greek practice to celebrate their annual grape harvests with two days of levity. The author's ploy here was to anchor the annual commemoration of Israel's rescue from Haman's vengeance in a captivating ritual. In the end, Gretz's ingenuity seemed not only to undercut the traditional veneration of Esther's historic, historic, historicity, but also to erode confidence in the existential purposefulness that he himself attributed to the text. Gretz's two-volume translation and commentary on Psalms, the most critical of its kind to date by a Jewish author, came out in 1881-82. To be sure, Christian scholars of the stature of Wilhelm de Wette, Ewald, and Justus Olshausen had preceded him with pioneering works. Like them, 
he deemed the Masoretic text deeply flawed and attributed none of the Psalms to King David. In contrast, the aesthetic sensibility of a herder was missing. Gretz's approach was primarily historical. The seven genres of psalms that he identified, he ordered into five chronological divisions from pre-exilic, exilic, post-exilic, Maccabean to post-Maccabean. Gretz assigned only 10 of these psalms to the Maccabean period, and Psalms 134 to 36 later still in conjunction with the Harvest Vest Festival of Sukkot, whose libation ceremony in the temple allegedly took place at night. When a psalm was filled with references to idolatry, Gretz tended to date it to pre-exilic times when idolatrous beliefs and practices still prevailed throughout the two kingdoms. In contrast, Psalms saturated with a sense of guilt expressed for Gretz the mood of the exiles in Babylonia. No matter how intensely personal, Gretz insisted the voice of the psalmist was always collective and national. Char characteristically, he expended a good part of his individual comments on each psalm ferreting out tenuous evidence for its dating and often slipping into conjectures readily disputable. More generally, Gretz tried his hand at unveiling the often confounding superscriptions of the psalms and was able to identify some of the musical instruments with which the psalms were rendered in the temple. The high watermark of the literature in the pre-exilic era for Gretz was the reign of King Hezekiah in Jerusalem at the end of the 8th century BCE, who cleansed the temple of all idolatry and restored the Levites to oversee its cult. Israel's monotheistic faith flourished briefly again as Isaiah inspired his royal protege, endowed with a pious disposition and poetic talent to compose personal and royal psalms that were deeply religious. True to his professional ethos, Gratz uh, grappled with the historical question, who wrote the Psalter, and assembled a large body of circumstantial evidence to identify and organize cadre of devout Levites, landless victims of poverty and abuse, they embodied the ascetic social ideal of Israelite religion. Gretz proposed that they stood behind the oft-repeated vague nomenclature of Anavim, Evyonim, and Aniim, those who are humble and impoverished, that recurs in the literature of the prophets and songs. Often organized as disciples of prophets, they recorded and transmitted their messages and composed and put to music psalms for rendition in the temple. On occasion, a prophet such as Jeremiah would arise in dark times from their midst. Inured to hardship and setbacks, they sustained after 586 BCE the allegiance of the exiles to God, his prophets, and their ancestral homeland. Not surprisingly, the book of Job came from their circle as well. In sum, Israel owed its survival to an identifiable and idealistic subset of Levites who transformed Judaism 
in the face of adversity as they turned prophecy into a literary force. Kratz did not exercise any greater restraint when it came to analyzing the division of the prophets. His defense of the traditional dating of the prophet Ezekiel to the Babylonian exile and the unity of his literary legacy was indeed a typical of Gretz's freewheeling analytic scalpel. His 1874 essay on the authenticity of the book was a repudiation of Tsuntz's belated foray into biblical criticism in which he had reassigned Ezekiel to the Persian period 440 to 400 BCE, rather than the scholarship of Wellhausen. Gretz argued that Ezekiel contained no presence of Persian content, that the imagery of the book betrayed Assyrian Babylonian influence and not Persian, and that the apocalyptic battle between Gog and Magog echoed the eruption of the Scythian terror. Entirely implausible for Gretz was dating Ezekiel after Ezra, whose revolutionary impact left no trace on him. In contrast to Tsuntz's philological scrutiny of Ezekiel's language, Gretz's argument tended to be largely contextual and comparative. Overall, Gretz divided the three major and 12 minor literary prophets of the Hebrew Bible into three chronological periods. In the process, many a prophetic book was deconstructed into blocks and fragments that derived from different figures at different times. Thus, Gretz posited that the book of Hosea contained the prophecies of two distinct prophets by that name, separated by decades. The first three chapters of the book, rich in figurative language, preserved a cutting indictment of the northern kingdom during the prosperous reign of Jeroboam II in the first half of the 8th century BCE, while the last 11 chapters emanated from a prophet distress by the looming destruction of the realm by Assyria in 722. Similarly, Gretz identified the words of at least three pro different prophets bearing the name Zechariah. In fact, the final chapter of the book seemed to date sometime after Ezra and constituted yet a fourth separate prophecy reflecting a Persian assault on Jerusalem in the reign of Artaxerxes III, unnoticed by historians until Gretz proudly made the connection. Even the book of Isaiah did not escape a measure of deconstruction by Gretz. He accepted the view that had come to prevail among Jewish scholars since Nachman Krochmal, despite the strident opposition of Samuel David Luzzato, the chapters 40 to 66 were the stirring language of imminent redemption from captivity on foreign soil and the uncompromising repudiation of polytheism in the form of Zoroastrianism by a prophet in exile whom scholars haplessly named simply Second Isaiah. But the exceptional poetry of his words and the power of his ideas invigorated faith in days of despair. In keeping with his own deep reserve of national feelings and in defiance of Christian typology, Gretz underscored Second Isaiah's arresting image of a suffering servant 
not for a single individual, but for the entire nation of Israel. The oppression of Israel in exile served to atone for the sins of the rest of humanity, even as a restoration to its homeland epitomized the innate capacity of national renewal. Moreover, the convergence of history with prophecy in the triumph of Cyrus and the fall of Babylonia cured Israel from the temptation to resume any idolatrous practice. The post-exilic prophets no longer invade against idolatry. Gretz's obsession with the dating of Psalms and prophets was not an end in itself. Once dated, a passage, poem, or prophecy could be assigned to its appropriate place in his narrative as a vital fragment of social history. Unhurried, unhurried and meticulous, his history of the biblical period down to the Maccabees incorporated its literature as well as its history. Often quoted at length, the literature provided not only abundant evidence of ancient Israel's religious creativity and theological distinctiveness, but also rich material to depict the social fabric public morality and fidelity or infidelity to its religious mission. The unequaled sweep, specificity, and drama of Gretz's work produced a grand history and literature of ancient Israel that largely adhered to its biblical sources. The final volume of Gretz's biblical history came out in 1876. Two years later, it would forever be overshadowed by the publication of Wellhausen's Geschichte Israels. Whereas Gretz had made his study of the sources subordinate to his narrative, Wellhausen made the eventual construction of his historical superstructure subordinate to its laser-like study of the sources as the altered title of the 1883 second edition of his book Prolegomena zur Geschichte Israels underscored. In 1886, Gretz countered with a blistering review in the Monatschrift a good part of which was reprinted later in Volume 2, Part 1, of his 1902 revised second edition of his biblical history. That 31-page endnote in small print entitled The Composition of the Torah, Order, or the Pentateuch became the official Breslau Seminary rejection of the documentary hypothesis. Gretz's second effort, no less antagonistic than his first, was more systematic and fundamental, opening with an instructive historical survey of biblical criticism. Gretz 